Hi, my name is Ian McFadden. I'm one of the pastors here at St. Moses Church. And I realize most of you are probably part of St. Moses Church, but uh, some of you might be watching this on the internet. Um, just, I don't know, maybe you're bored during this pandemic and just uh, swiping and scrolling. And uh, if that's you, you're so welcome. You're so welcome uh, here to plug in with us on Sundays online. And I hope uh, that you hear something encouraging this morning. I'm just going to pray before we dive in. Father, would you come be with your people? Would you open our ears, uh, make our hearts soft so they can listen to you? Speak to us through your word and encourage us and draw us close to you this morning, we pray. Amen. One of my earliest friends in a church I used to pastor was a bright, talented young businessman. I'll call him Chris. Uh, he and his wife had a fantastic, adorable uh, young family. He was charismatic and generous, and they used to love to entertain people in their homes. And, and both of them were always ready to share with people the incredible story of how God had transformed their lives from brokenness uh, into flourishing. And then one day, it was like time began to work backwards. Addictions began to escalate, and it went from little things overnight uh, escalated in seriousness and in pace. So a porn addiction escalated into prostitutes, and recreational drugs uh, went into all of a sudden uh, days of blacked outness in motel room somewhere. And by this point, I was pretty deeply involved. We'd get together multiple times a week uh, for months on end. We did accountability. We did discipleship. We read the Bible together. I coached him, and I prayed. Man, did I pray. I prayed like a guy whose life depended on it, because I felt like more or less my friend's life did. I threw everything I had at it, my best books, uh, time, hours and hours, and emotional energy, so much emotional energy. My, my most persuasive, most urgent prayers. This seemed to me like something God should want to answer, if anything. Like he had miraculously transformed this guy's life once already, and what's better than that? Like the only thing better than that is doing it twice, right? And then one night in the small hours of the morning, uh, an attorney and a police officer and I were digging stashes of drugs out of his abandoned truck somewhere and recovering the truck. And I think it was then that my hope started to wane. Not all at once, but it just kind of began to leak out of the corner, as it were. Like, uh, like little ping, pinpricks uh, started to spring leaks. And at first I could cover them up with a, a finger of will here, a, a thumb of prayer there or a, a Bible verse here memorized, but with the passage of time and setbacks and week after week, quickly it began to feel like there were more holes, more leaks than there were fingers. My plugs couldn't keep up with the leaking hope. Some of you are there right now, and some of you, I think, are probably a little bit worried that you are on that glide path. Today, friends, is for you. God loves to speak to his people, especially when his people are willing to listen to him, even when they feel like hope is slipping away. Last week, we began this series on the gentleness of God. And, and the gentleness of God isn't like a main systematic theology category. If you were to pick up a, a tome on the doctrine of God, you're not going to find chapter after chapter on God's gentleness. But part of that is because most of these books weren't written comparing God with all the other things that we worship. They weren't written comparing the one true God of the Bible with the other gods of, uh, of the other major world religions. They weren't written comparing the one true God of the Bible with the, the sort of impersonal forces of secular humanism or with all the other things and people that we look to for our comfort or for our security or for our rescue or for guidance or for hope. They just weren't written comparing God 
with those things. And yet, of course, that was the world of the Bible. That comparative, multi-perspectival world was the world that the Bible was written into. And so it's natural that the authors of the Bible highlight his compassion and the tenderness and the meekness and the humility and the kindness and all the other ways of fleshing out the gentleness of the one true God who is. Because, friends, he is utterly unique. And I think I'm probably not the only one who needs to be reminded of that six months into a global pandemic. So today we're talking about the gentleness of God toward those with waning hopes. And that's where our main text comes in. If you didn't already read 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 20, just pause me and start uh, by reading that. And you can read it in the NLT version. That's the version I'll be referring to. The scene, really, it's a tearjerker. Hannah is wounded in in maybe one of the tenderest places that a human can be. She wants to be a mom. She longs to be a mother, but hasn't been able to be yet. Time is slipping away. And to make matters worse, she has this rival. She, her husband, Elkanah, has a, a second wife who is as spiteful as she is fertile. And so Hannah's life is miserable. And each year when they go make the trek to worship at the tabernacle in Shiloh, all she can bring is her pain. Her faith, her hopes are in tatters, so much so that she won't even participate in the covenant meals. But gathering her shreds of hope, she still prays. Not not like those confident, barnstorming, church-like prayers, but, but shaking, sobbing prayers. Ugly crying. The kind that makes the priest walk away and think that she's drunk. The kind that makes a gentle God lean in. And then Hannah explains to the priest Eli what's going on, and he has a change of heart. And God pronounces to her, through Eli's lips, his promise. May the God of Israel grant you what you have asked. If you've been around the block a time or two in the Bible, uh, this story will come to you as a bit of deja vu. It's, It's not the first time a couple has watched hope leak through the hole punched by infertility. It's not the first time that God has intervened gently and graciously at what felt like the 11th hour. Actually, it's a major theme in the Bible. The Bible's primary answer to the question, what is God's response to the legitimate hopes of his people? The the Bible's primary answer to that question is that he lovingly fulfills our hopes. In fact, more than that, he's often the planter, the instigator, the nurturer of our hopes. That's, that's what he's doing when he popped into the, uh, the little sort of retirement efficiency of Abram and Sarai and said, um, by the way, you're going to be parents of nations. That's what he was doing when he interrupted the prophet Nathan's dream to tell him, to tell David, that David's son would sit on his throne and that in fact he would have an everlasting dynasty. God is the God who plants these seeds of audacious, hard to shake, out of your heart sort of hopes. But But circumstances and setbacks and the passage of time have a way of shaking even hard-to-shake hope. Last year, I got in touch with a pastor friend here in Baltimore. It had been a hard stretch through the fall for me, and I was feeling disappointed. And I knew that if anyone had stared down the barrel of disappointment that he had, he had spent years years of his life in praying for this city that we love, specifically in praying for East Baltimore. He had spent nights on his face in city parks praying for change, for God to bring transformation and hope. He had helped to spearhead movements of prayer around the city, and staggeringly, he had seen real change happen. Not like the the sort of subjective change that we Christians often like to talk about, but measurable, observable, precipitous drops in crime. 
not from an increase in arrest, but from an increase in prayer. He'd seen deepening community respect. He'd seen deepening trust and restored respect across categories. And then beginning in 2015, it was like time started to play backward. Crime skyrocketed, relationships tanked, trust was eroded. And I wanted to ask him about hope. Do you still have it? How do you hold on to it? I wanted to know. Hope in the Bible is often synonymous with trust. And although the Bible's primary message about God's response to our hopes is that he lovingly fulfills them, it usually involves waiting. And the thing about waiting, that space between the planting of the seed of hope and its fulfillment, is that during that space, things can break either way, can't they? As time wears on, it's natural to have questions, age-old questions that crop up right near the beginning of the Bible that we all need to settle for ourselves. But, But given a season of waiting, those questions can start to loom larger even than the hopes that we originally had. Questions like, is God good? Does he actually have my best interest in mind? Is he Is he able to do anything about this, even if he wants to? Have I been fooling myself all along? But waiting can also have the effect of deepening and broadening our faith, of deepening our gratitude. When we were camping a few weeks ago, it was cold, at least in in Colorado at night. It was insufferably hot across the Midwest and then shiveringly cold in Colorado. And I told Jill that um, we were only allowed to take a couple of changes of clothes each. So uh, we were all able to experience those extremes of temperature in all of their glory. Our campsite in Colorado overlooked this um, east-facing slope. And Deck would usually get up with me first thing in the morning before the sun hit those slopes and help me start the stove and make coffee and oatmeal. And then Isla would emerge in uh, pink penguin PJs or something like that. And the three of us would cup our hot drinks and our hot oatmeal, and we would stack up three in one camp chair for warmth. And we would watch the sun creep down that slope facing us, just waiting for it to reach us. We were cold, but we knew that within minutes of the sun reaching us, we'd be shucking off layers. And so we just watched it. Watched it and waited, trusting. This is what it's like waiting on God, I told them. It's, it's coldest often, right before the sun hits. But, but you wait because you know that he's faithful. So we'd, we'd sit there like Psalm 119, verse 123. My eyes strain to see your rescue, God, to see the truth of your promise fulfilled. More than once, a bank of clouds covered the sun before it ever got to us. And in those times, we had to wait without the benefit of watching its steady progress toward us. So I said to my friend, what about your, what about your hopes for Baltimore right now? He said, I'm incubating a few specific promises. Or at least that incubating was the word that I had in mind as he explained to me what it was like. He said, I don't know how or when God will fulfill them, but there are a few specific hopes that he was fairly confident God had given him for this city. And he felt like obedience to God was to to remind God of these hopes, to remind God of these promises, to hold them before him in prayer, to, to tend to them sort of like a priest at the altar before God. And so when I asked him, how can I help you? How can I serve you and support you? He said, you can incubate these hopes with me. And so I do. I consider it a great privilege, and I I picture myself like like an emperor penguin with an egg on my toes. I, I can't make it hatch but I can hunker over it. I can I can protect it. I can steward it and keep it a warm Keep it warm and keep it alive until God breaks it open. 
I think some of us need to be a little bit daring and to expand the circle of people who are incubating hope along with us. In Pentecostal circles, it's much more common to hear the phrase, what are you trusting God for? Or what are you believing God for? Some of uh, us from reform circles get a little bit ticklish about that sort of language, but I think there's actually something deeply biblical. I think if we're wise to share discerningly with trusted brothers and sisters about what we're hoping for and to enlist their help in hoping and praying for it, not only does that expand the circle of people who will be able to give God thanks and praise when he does bring them to fulfillment, but often in the Bible, the fulfillment of God's promises spans across generations. Get this. So although Abram and Sarah were in the end, blessed with a few kids before they died. They died before they were parents of nations. And so it was Isaac, their son, who believed and nurtured and incubated that hope and passed it on to Jacob, his son, and so on down through the generations, they held on to the hope that God would do what he had promised. And so the fragile hopes of the exiles in Psalm 137 are incubated despite oppression, despite setback, despite injustice, despite delay, they are incubated and they are passed down to the generation of Psalm 126 who see and who celebrate God's faithfulness to them and to their parents. But not all hopes are fulfilled. Even the mention of Hannah and of Abram and Sarah can feel like mockery to some of us who have desperately hoped and prayed and seen no answer. So though the Bible's primary answer to the question, how does God respond to the legitimate hopes of his people, is that he lovingly fulfills them, the Bible also offers a secondary answer, a sort of caveat. Sometimes God doesn't answer our most heartfelt prayers. Sometimes he doesn't meet our hopes the way we'd like. Have you noticed the last thing Jesus' disciples said to him before he ascended? So right, he's, he's lived among them. He has died an atoning death on the cross. He's been resurrected on the third day. Then he's appeared to them over the course of 40 days to, to, to sort of verify his aliveness. And he's given them final instructions. And then it's like his, his feet are a couple inches off the ground. as He's ascending towards heaven, as it were. And they go, um, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and to restore our kingdom? That's in Acts chapter 1, verse 6. And actually, it literally says, they kept on asking him. Do you ever wonder why, at that last minute before Jesus ascends, when they patently don't get it, do you, do you ever wonder why Jesus didn't go just like, time out, guys? That's not the plan. And then all over again, patiently, like, get out the PowerPoint and explain to them so that they see clearly what his plan is. But he doesn't. He doesn't do that. He, he, if you look at his answer, he sort of redirects instead of corrects. Their hopes were good hopes. Their hopes were, were in ways, legitimate hopes. But if I'd been one of those disciples with Jesus, and Jesus had actually said, no, I, I've got a different plan. I'm doing something different than that. I wonder if I would have had the ears to hear it. Because instead of what they'd hoped for, he was actually about to radically recapitulate Israel around belief in him and around the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit of God. And instead of restoring the national boundaries of Israel, he was about to inaugurate this multinational, multi-ethnic kingdom that had no boundaries. If he'd told them that a scant like 300 years later, off some windswept rocky island off the coast of Scotland, that some pale-faced foreigners would be worshiping Jesus with song and with reading scripture, do you think they would have believed it? If he had told them that a, a scant two millennia later, people from African descent and Asian descent and South American descent and European descent would be reading their story and would be praising Jesus and would be singing songs to him over a computer app called Zoom, do you think they would have, well, 
you get the point. I'm not trying to explain away the mystery of unanswered prayers, and I'm certainly not trying to just sidestep that pain. I love you guys too much to do that. I've seen the pain that many of you carry from those disappointments. I'm suggesting that the Bible's secondary answer to how God responds to our hopes is that he gently redirects them to an ultimate fulfillment in him. In a way, that's the second thing Pastor Don said when I asked him about disappointment and hope. He said essentially that he's loosened his grasp on some of the things that he was hoping for, and he's doubled down his commitment to the one he's hoping in. We can't say with total confidence the shape that God's fulfillments of our hopes will take. But when the Psalms talk about hope, their overriding message is that God, even more than our dreams or expectations, even more than the seeds of dreams that he plants in us, that God is to be our hope's object. And I'll put some scripture passages on the screen that you can track down. So in Hebrews chapter 11 is polishing off the trophies of this list of faithful saints who have gone before. It says in verse 13, amazingly, that all these people died still believing what God had promised them, and yet they did not receive everything that was promised. They saw it from a distance and welcomed it. And at the end of the chapter, it says that they won't receive the complete fulfillment of those promises until they do so together with us, which is pretty incredible. Some of you had hopes that COVID has completely punctured. Some of you have faced deferment after deferment as the time has ground on. And I want to just uh, tell you that the witness of the Bible and the witness of God's Spirit in my life is that God isn't capricious. He's not cruel. He isn't playing games with us. Though, I get it, sometimes it can feel like that. The only true God who is, the God the Bible speaks of, the Bible makes clear that he is good and he's gentle. Maybe you have a seed of hope that the Lord has given you and you need some help to, to incubate it. Maybe you need to find a trusted sister or brother in Christ and, and together with them to, to strengthen and encourage each other in waiting, in straining your eyes to see the Lord's fulfillment. You need each other to, to help you in the trusting. And some of us are recovering from disappointment, maybe scared to hope for much because you've been let down. Let's allow God, gentle God, to gently bring some daylight between what we hope for and who we hope in. And let's allow him to lead us into doubling down our hope in him again. He's worth hoping in. Let me pray for us. Father, gentle Father, good and loving Father, would you pour out your spirit on all who hear this, on St. Mo's and others beyond. Father, we are, most of us, uh, hurting, and tired, and in many cases at a loss, without the answers, and many facing crushed hopes, or deferred hopes, or uh, ruptured hopes, and Father, we need you. We need the balm of your gentleness. Would you redirect our hope into you, and would you bring about fulfillment of the hopes that you have? Would you, would you strengthen our hope in those God-given visions and promises? And would you help us to be incubators of one another's hope for your glory, for our good, and for the flourishing of this city, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.